Um, I'm Amy Barker, and I'm a nurse practitioner with Peace Palm. Um, and I'm co presenting with Dr. Um, Erica Reynolds from Peace Indo. Uh, we don't have any disclosures today, um, either one of us. Um, and we're going to be talking about my chart with um, mainly a focus on the utilization within the PEAS world and um, more so the proxy access. Um, we also have one of our um, uh, educational specialists um, that's going to do a demo at the end. So thank you so much for um, coming, Ben. So um, just from a my chart kind of standpoint, I think of um, benefits. I guess I should advance my slide. Uh, hold on, Janie, we can't get it. We broke it. I'm going to do it this way. Okay. Um, from the my chart benefits, I think of it um, as a twofold kind of thing for one for patients and one for providers. Um, for the patient, really, it helps with um, patient care and satisfaction, um, and it can improve it in a number of ways that we'll discuss um, as we go through this presentation. And then um, also, uh, it can improve provider clinical workflows. I think the key thing to remember is that um, it's key to educate not only the provider and staff, but also the patient and guardian um, regarding the MyChart utilities that they can access. So results is a huge one, of course. We know with the CARES Act, um, all labs and imaging results auto-release, except for those that we may mark um, as not to auto-release. Um, and then there's a couple that are um, sensitive test results that are automatically um, not auto-released as well. So really these patients are getting these results in real time, um, pretty much at the same time that um, the providers are getting them. Um, and so I think it's really important for the individuals that are utilizing my chart to just um, incorporate in their verbiage that um, during the visit that you may, um, your patient expectations rather, um, for provider communication concerning results. So really saying something along the lines of, we're gonna have some results come back. Uh, you're gonna get those at the same time that I get them um, and uh, you know, give us, about two business days to get back in touch with you, but hopefully we'll get back sooner than that. And if there's anything concerning, of course, sooner than that as well. Um, the other thing that I think is important to um, do, you can also put like a ABS smart phrase regarding results and just letting um, the individuals know when to expect communications. And then if you're ordering multiple results, um, letting them know that you'll get back to them once all those results um, have come back to you and you're able to discuss them um, all at once. This will cut down on those little tiny individual communications back and forth that might kind of fill up your box a little bit too much. Um, and there is some verbiage also that um, the providers have two business days to get back to you um, regarding those results. So that is there on my chart. Um, the other thing is, is letters. I think this actually cuts down a lot on our staff's um, extra work. So um, printing out those excuses that maybe somebody lost, um, it also kind of keeps a record of the individual's um, absences or um, appointments so that um, if the school starts to get concerned about those, the family has that for a reference. The other thing is, is that our school forms come up in a letter form. So for that reason, um, when they go to letters, the school form will be there. The important thing to note, though, is there is no provider signature on there. And of course, the exam, if they're needing that actual exam part, that back page, that won't be there either. But this is the way that they can print off the immunization records. And it's a nicer kind of form than going to the actual immunizations um, kind of navigator on my chart for the, the patients. This is a really cool feature. I just wanted to point this out to you guys. I don't know how many of you know that this is there, but I think in the PEDS world, it's pretty important. And even more so for our um, parents that have kids less than two, they really like to look and see how their little ones are growing. So this um, allows them to pull that up and just um, really be able to follow that and not have to hold on to paper. They can print it for their baby books and all that kind of stuff. So just wanted to point that feature out as well. Um, and then really, I think the biggest thing for us as providers is um, patient communication. Um, so I think a lot of us feel strongly about this, possibly one way or the other. And um, 
I uh, hope to kind of change some of your negative thoughts um, regarding patient communication. I think that one thing I definitely want to point out as um, you can see here, I don't know how many of you have accessed your my chart for yourselves or for your kids, um, but these are the different categories that you can choose from. Um, most of your um, information or your questions rather will come in on non-urgent medical questions, but um, they can come in in any of those. And so once you click that, um, then it will give you a different providers that you can access to send those questions to. So um, uh, that really helps the, the patient be able to communicate with us when they have time. This may be, you know, for a working parent that's super busy the middle of the night um, when they think about it or get a chance to send that question to us. I think it's important to note that there is a character limit. Um, and so I know probably more so some of you than others get those really long messages. Um, and sometimes you even get two messages back to back about the same concern. Uh, and so um, that was adjusted with Epic Horizon My Chart. Um, and so it was cut down, but there, um, those characters, I believe, is still about half of a page typed. Um, and so the characters include spaces too. So we do have verbiage on there that um, if it takes more than one message um, to uh, send a question to your provider that you should be calling the office. Um, and then um, it also says that you should ha expect uh, 48 business hours before you have a return call. So it is um, on there. And again, you can see from our um, choices, non-urgent. So urgent is not um, a reason for them to be using this. So kind of thinking about things um, from a provider using uh, the MyChart messages um, and just MyChart uh, utility for us. Um, so I think the big two things are telephone versus MyChart messages. Um, so if you think about a telephone, I don't know about y'all's office, but um, the nurses are rarely sitting that we don't have a designated person to answer phone. So they have to have the time to get the message off of the voicemail. So they, um, so they can kind of review those different requests. Um, then they're required to open up that telephone message. Most oftentimes, it's, if it's not simple, they're then, of course, reaching out to the family. Um, you can see here, um, as I'm sure you're aware of, that can have multiple different communications between the provider and the nurse, the nurse and the staff, um, I mean, and the um, patient, and then uh, it can also be between us. So lots of back and forth that can occur. Um, and then again, just the big thing I think, especially with um, individuals that we are familiar with that take a long time to answer questions, or you know that phone call is gonna take an extended amount of time, we have to have that time to sit down and discuss these things. My chart message um, allows the message to go to the, the nursing pool. Um, so the initial message will be screened by all the nurses. Um, and some of those message, messages are reviewed and addressed um, and completed without um, any involvement by us. Um, and um, that communication back and forth with the patient is through my chart, so it can be done when the nurse has time as well. Um, and we can uh, do my chart messaging directly with our patients. Um, and um, that can be done at the generation of the new message if we generate the new message or if we're replying. So that can take the nurse out of the um, involvement completely, which is helpful for them. They can do other things. Um, and um, the big thing that I think is, is that there's documentation already started. It's there, it's part of the medical record, able to review by us as well as um, the patients too. Again, it is key just to um, educate your patients on when and how to use um, the MyChart messaging. So I just wanted to point out here, um, the other thing is, is we can choose to do direct communication. Um, if you see right here, um, you can click that. It is not always clicked. It's defaults to not being clicked. So if you don't do anything with it, it'll go straight back to the nursing pool. Um, the other thing that I want to point out is, is there is a default. So it says notify me within, um, and that is a week. So the week um, 
that is something that we can change. I think that's important, especially if our patients are wanting us to communicate our results through um, my chart because it's just easier for them. That way we can know that they opened it or they didn't and we can follow up via phone if we need to. We have a question from Dr. Keys. He yes. said, in my chart, you can send a message to the physician or ACP. Do the nurses view these first or do they directly go to the provider? So before um, we had one of our upgrades, some of the different departments had some of them going to certain providers and not to the nursing pool. So the default now across the board is going all, so ACPs and docs, all their messages um, for their patients from my chart go to the nursing pool first. And that nursing pool is set up based on your office. Um, so another thing that I think is great um, uh, in, especially I think in our kids that get all these different rashes and that kind of stuff, that's a huge concern of parents that a lot of times they don't need to be seen for is um, documenting pictures in my chart. So they are able to upload pictures to us and we're able to review them. Again, those do um, become part of the medical chart. So um, I think that's a great feature that we're not able to do otherwise. Um, and then you can also have documents for review. I recently had a family send me an FMLA paper. Um, they scanned it and uploaded it as a picture and I was able to print it and finish it. And then um, I did not upload it and send it back through my chart. I had them come get it just because of um, HIPAA and all that. So great feature also that I wanted to make sure you guys were aware of. So some benefits and things to come. Some of you might already be aware of this with our gen keys. Um, my chart um, users can do self scheduling for well checkups. Um, we are starting to do questionnaires. Actually, if you see here, um, you can add questionnaires. Um, we don't really have any for our peace department yet, um, but we are piloting those of the my chart uh, um, Epic Horizons group. So we'll hopefully be able to put some of those up soon. And then we've also done multilingual um, on my chart, which is helpful for our other families that are non English speaking. So now Dr. Reynolds will um, discuss the proxy access. Thank you. So, uh, yes, I wanted to talk about proxy access because I find that um, it is actually very complicated and can be a little bit confusing. And oftentimes um, the access is not set up correctly um, in Epic. So um, basically the term proxy access just means that one person has access to another person's medical record. Um, so uh, if you have a parent that's interested in getting proxy access, um, they don't have to be a Carilion patient themselves. You can still set up that access uh, for them in EPIC. Um, most proxy access requires a consent form, a physical form that has to be signed and scanned into EPIC. And for most types of access, this has to be done once a year. Um, so, and uh, it's important when you're setting this up in, in EPIC to make sure that if it's proxy access that you're setting it up as proxy. Uh, several times I've seen someone set up proxy access for a parent and they've set it up as if the, um, the parent were the patient. Um, they've put the parent's information in as if it were the patient's, um, the patient's information and it was the patient's account. Um, so um, how do you get these consent forms that I just mentioned? So uh, from a practical standpoint, I print them out and just keep them in all of my exam rooms so that I can quickly grab one and hand one to the patient. But they're very easy uh, to print from Epic. They're built into uh, the letters um, section and you can save them to your, uh, to your favorites in your letters. So what you wanna do is just search for proxy um, and then you can see the different, um, the different consent forms for my chart um, and print them just from the letters tab. Um, so there are different types of proxy access. Um, so uh, an adult can have access to another adult's chart. Like let's say, for example, you wanted to be able to access your elderly parents uh, chart. Um, you can do that. Um, you might also have say an elderly parent that uh, has you know, severe dementia and to the point where they can't um, consent for their own. They, they can't give medical consent. Um, and so that would be an adult lacking capacity. And with proper doc documentation, you can set up that type of access. Um, there's a, kind of a similar access for um, minor patients who are under 18 and who are considered incapacitated. Um, so as in um, they are unable to, uh, to give consent. 
Um, so that type of access is a little bit different. Um, the advantage to setting it up uh, as an incapacitated minor is that um, it does not have to be renewed every year um, until the patient turns turns 18 if that patient is deemed to be um, incapacitated and unable to give consent. Um, there's uh, two types of access for our pediatric patients. Uh, there, uh, it's different when the child is uh, less than 12 um, or older than 12. And we'll talk about that in more detail. For our adolescent patients who are aged 12 to 17 years, um, there's full access um, and there's limited access. Um, and uh, it's important to understand what you can see with those different types of access, particularly because um, if you have a parent that's accessing their minor uh, chart and then when they turn 12, it's automatically going to revert to limited access from full access, and which can be confusing for families because it looks like they still have access in my chart, but in fact, they can see very little. Um, so really, they can only see the immunizations and the allergies. So um, if you have an adolescent patient, they can actually get their own MyChart account now. This was new um, in the last few years. Um, so then they can have a separate account with their own username and password. Um, they do require the parents uh, to sign permission for them to have access unless they're an emancipated minor or if they're a minor that is receiving adult deemed services. So um, most of you guys are aware that adolescents can receive medical care without parental consent for certain things, including testing or treatment for sexually transmitted infections, birth control, pregnancy, substance abuse, mental health. So um, if you're um, receiving care for some of those things, you can get uh, access to uh, my chart without parental consent, but you need to be careful about this in case the parent might also have access um, to my chart. We're gonna talk about. Um, so I wanted to make another note about the incapacitated minor access. Um, so uh, that access, the physician has to sign the consent form um, and con uh, really basically uh, confirming that in your opinion as the physician that the patient is incapacitated, meaning they cannot um, give consent. Um, and again, once you do that, then that access is good until the patient turns age 18 and then they would be an incapacitated adult and the access would have to be set up again. Um, so for, um, for our patients under 12, the access is a little bit more simple. Um, you must be a legal guardian uh, to qualify for having my chart access. Um, I think it's helpful to know that multiple guardians can have um, my chart access with their own accounts, with their own usernames and passwords, and can still see all the patient's medical information. Uh, I found that to be very helpful with, for example, maybe you have parents that are divorced and both have custody, and then everyone can see when the appointments are, what the plan was from the visits, um, they can message with questions, and the parents aren't having to necessarily communicate directly with one another to make sure all the information is shared. They can access it directly in my chart. Um, and again, like I mentioned, um, on the 12th birthday, the access will revert uh, to limited access. Um, so um, limited access for an adolescent patient does not require um, the parents to consent for that, or excuse me, for the patients to consent um, for the parents to have access, but the, all they can see is immunizations um, and um, allergies. So it's really not very helpful, um, to be honest. Um, full access requires um, the patient to consent for their parent to see their chart. Um, and this consent form has to be signed by the patient, the parent, and by the provider. Uh, it's really, it's important for the provider to actually sit down and talk with, um, with the adolescent make sure that they understand what they're um, giving consent for. So it's really not something that can be done by administrative staff. It has to be done by the provider. Um, and in the, in the ideal world, the way this would happen would be, you know, you would be spending your one-on-one -on -one time with the adolescent patient with the parent in the waiting room, and you could take that opportunity to explain to them um, how my chart works, and they could give true consent for whether or not they wanted to, um, to give their parent access. Um, the reality is sometimes a little bit different. So you might be in a visit with a patient and the parent asks you about getting my chart access, you know, before you've had the opportunity to talk separately with the adolescent. You, know, you may have a parent that is accustomed to having my chart access before their um, child turned 12 um, and want to continue having that access. And so oftentimes in those situations, um, I will consent the adolescent with the parent in the room and just have a frank discussion with everyone making sure that everyone understands what the rules are, that this consent has to be renewed every year, what can be seen in my chart, um, and talk a little bit about why um, it is that the um, 
the child has to give uh, permission for their parent um, to access that information and talk a little bit about what are those um, services that uh, adolescents can get care for without parental consent. And make sure that the adolescent understands that the access can be revoked anytime. Um, and um, talk a little bit of, with adolescents about um, how they can still make sure that they uh, can receive a confidential care um, even with the MyChart access um, if that's necessary um, for them. Um, so again, this um, can be a point of frustration for, for a lot of parents. Um, so you have to kind of help them understand how, um, yes, we would like everyone to um, have open communication about, about everything, but we just have to be particularly cautious um, for, this, for our adolescent population for the rare times when um, there's information that um, adolescents don't want to be shared. Um, parents also sometimes get upset when they're accustomed to having my chart access and then um, their year is up and then their access is suddenly gone. Um, and that can be very frustrating because the, the, this has to be renewed in person because you have to consent the adolescent every year and have them sign this physical piece of paper. And so um, they have to come into the office to do that. And that is frustrating for families, but is the, is the reality. Um, so again, the limited access um, really just allows that you to see vaccine records um, and um, allergies and not um, all, you can't even see when your upcoming appointments are. That again can be frustrating for parents because many of them rely on my chart for knowing when their upcoming appointment is. Um, so um, I think um, it's, it's important for us all to remember whether you're a big my chart utilizer or not, um, that you need to be aware that due to the Cures Act office visits and telephone notes from both you and your staff um, are visible in my chart. Um, and so even if you have a patient that might not currently have my chart access, you need to keep in mind that at some point in the future, another provider in another specialty area might sign your patient up or your um, the guardian up for my chart access and they may retroactively be able to read your notes. So our recommendation is that we always be documenting um, and assuming that um, our um, parents and, and guardians may be reading these um, phone notes and office notes. Um, there are times definitely where you may need to document something in the medical record that you really don't want the parents to see. And so, you know, at times the way I've handled that is that I've created a separate progress note um, where I put that information and then mark it as sensitive um, so it's not released to my chart. And if you do that, you have to indicate that either the patient has requested that you do that or um, that uh, there's a, a significant risk of harm to the patient should that be released in my chart. Um, you can mark your entire note as sensitive, um, but again, you know, the, we really don't want to mark things as sensitive if they're not. Um, and also then the parent might wonder, like, well, where's the office note from that visit? You know, why, why can't I see that? Um, so be very careful. And you also have to educate your staff to be careful about um, how they document um, phone notes in, uh, in EPIC. Um, so, um, we have um, a few minutes left for questions, and we also want to just, just kind of show you guys how in Epic um, you can activate someone's MyChart account yourself. So I think if, um, if Ben has time and can share his screen, we'll have him show you that. Um, also just wanted to mention that um, Amy and I are on the MyChart committee. So you know we're your representatives, and if you all have questions about MyChart or um, you know, things that you feel like are areas for improvement, um, please let us know. And if you guys would like future lunch and learns on um, my chart related topics, we'd be happy to do that. Um, so maybe if, um, if Ben's able to share a screen, off the top there. Sorry about that, everybody. All right, so um, I've accessed the MyChart administration activity. Um, the simple shortcut to do so is just to click the MyChart logo. It's the computer monitor um, if they're active with a check mark or with an X if they're inactive. Um, 
And then for assigning proxies, we have two categories. Um, there's people that the patient can access and then people who can access the patient. Um, so to assign proxy access, uh, we would simply go under give proxy access, the button here. And then um, we can search for existing patients, which I'll show you first. Um, we can also search existing MyChart accounts, um, regardless of whether they're a patient, if they have MyChart through another organization or something along those lines, or if they are a non-patient. Um, so first I'll show you the simplest, which is to search existing patients. Um, we can search by name or MRN. Um, we see other categories as well. Um, and I'm going to select here Deborah Kentucky, um, who is another just test patient here in our training environment. Um, then you'll see that the relationship is hard stopped. So we have to specify what the relationship is. Um, in this case, I'm, I'm dealing with two adult patients. Um, so we would, we would assume um, proxy full adult, something along those lines or full incapacitated depending or adult accessing adult up here. Um, so we choose the relationship and then simply click accept and that would assign our relationship there. Cancel that. I'm going to reselect get proxy access here and I'll go under search my chart accounts. So here we can search by first and last and birth date, or um, we can create a non patient account for uh, uh, for an adult that does not have uh, my chart account or um, is not a Karelian patient. Um, so here we see that the name and birth date are hard stopped and those are the two categories that need to be filled out. Um, we probably would want to collect an email address as well. Um, just to make sure that we can send them the uh, sign up code if we're not printing it out on the after visit summary. And I will cancel that because we don't want to actually create there. Um, beyond that, I, um, I'll, I'll take questions or if there's anything else that you would like me to demonstrate Dr. Reynolds, I'm happy to do so. I think 1 of the things that Amy and I have found is that the box for access class also needs to be um, filled in or it doesn't seem like the access um, will go through correctly. And that's a little tricky because it's not a hard stop. Yeah, that hourglass, we found that that needs to be filled in for whether it's a, um, the correct type of proxy, whether it's a minor patient under age 12 or um, if it's an adolescent patient, whether it's a full or limited access. Great, thank you for that. 